Hello and welcome to our small anatomy session. Today the topic is the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is the most flexible joint in the human body. Here we see the various bony parts. In Latin it is also called articulatio humerus cupularis, in other words, the joint between the scapula and the humerus. The shoulder blade is the most important part in the shoulder joint. It is situated on the dorsal side of the thorax. It is a flat bone with several protrusions, which we will still talk through in a moment. The second part of the shoulder joint is the upper arm bone, or humerus, whose humeral head fits into the socket of the shoulder blade. At first, let's have a look at the scapula. The scapula consists of several furrows and protrusions, which make an anatomical orientation possible. On the dorsal side of the scapula, we see a strong bone protrusion, the spina scapulae, which extends ventrally towards the acromion, or summit, of the shoulder. There are two furrows each above and below the spina scapulae where the origins of the muscle can be found. On the one hand, above the spina scapulae, the so-called fossa supraspinata, in other words, situated above the spina, and on the other, below the spina scapulae, the fossa infraspinata. If we turn the whole thing on its ventral side, we see a furrow here too, which in this case points towards the ribs. That is the so-called fossa subscapularis. Strong muscles are attached inside this whole fossa which runs to the upper arm bone or humerus. At the front, bordering the shoulder blade, we see the clavicula or collarbone, which is also connected here to the shoulder blade by a joint. Here we also see various tendons which stabilize the connection between the clavicula and the shoulder blade. To look at the upper arm bone or humerus, one can also distinguish some important anatomical structures here. Firstly, of course, the humeral head and the humeral shaft, and then strong bone protrusions in the area of the humeral head. Here, the so-called tuberculum magus, in other words, a large bone bed serving as attachment for muscles. And here on the ventral side, the tuberculum minus, a small bone bed. A sulcus runs between these two tubercula, in other words, a shallow groove. It is called the sulcus intertubercularis and represented here by this small piece of cord, the tendon of the long head of the bicep, which runs in this sulcus intertubercularis into the shoulder joint. When you take a look at the shoulder joint, you actually realize how relative few tendon structures are in place here compared to other joints. It is, in other words, a predominantly muscle-guided joint. Now we want to take another look at these muscles individually. These are called rotator cuffs. Why cuffs? Because these muscles close around the humeral head like a cuff. Individually, these muscles are the musculus teres minor, which practically stretch from the scapula to the tuberculum majus of the upper arm bone. Then the musculus infraspinatus lying underneath the spina scapula, in other words, a continuous, more or less triangular muscle, which converges here with the tuberculum magus, its attachment with its fibers. And above the spina scapulae, then the musculus supraspinatus, which then again practically stretches underneath the acromions right to the tuberculum magus of the humerus. There is a fourth muscle on the ventral side, which belongs to the rotator cuff. That is the musculus subscapularis, which then attaches to the tuberculum minus of the humerus. Together, these four muscles lead to the head of the humerus, and of course can also move the humerus. They stabilize the shoulder joint. When we now simply pull off the musculus subscapularis, we also find out that, lo and behold, the upper arm bone does not even have a proper socket but it basically lies in a very small socket, which the shoulder blade makes available to it. The so-called cavitas glenoidale, which really does not encase such a large surface area of the cartilage-covered head of the humerus. This surface area is somewhat enlarged by a piece of fibrocartilage, which can be seen by these gray structures, which lie around this socket, and that way slightly enlarge the socket. That is the so-called labrum glenoidale. The shoulder joint is therefore a really complex joint, especially in order to allow the shoulder joint many different degrees of freedom of movement. Because we see that the shoulder joint can indeed be moved in several directions and with that, it of course also has the possibility to take the arm with it in many different directions, so to speak. 
Here, when looking from the lateral side, one can see that the soft parts between the bony structures actually have relatively little room. And from a clinical perspective, that results in a so-called impingement syndrome under certain conditions. That means that the soft parts get pinched between the bones, and that can cause pain in the shoulder joint.